All right. Uh, I would like to echo, uh, you know, that round of appreciation or applause for the, the choir director as well as the choir. Okay, they put a lot of time and uh, their talents into serving the Lord and praying the Lord this day. So, would you with me join with me and just give them a round of applause? It's, it was. You just don't wake up and are able to sing like that, right? It takes practice and effort. And so uh, this morning, I just want to shortly um, give you a challenge. It won't be shortly. <laughs> I'll try to keep it a little bit concise here. But uh, the content of what was sung about comes from the truth of the Scripture. We're going to read a little bit from Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, and we're going to see the sovereign and the Savior in the text because we see it and hear it in all of the words of the Christmas hymns and the Christmas carols that we sing. You know, the Christmas season, if you would turn to Luke chapter 2, uh, the Christmas season means different things to different people. To some, it means simply having a wonderful Christmas time, you know, it's time of celebration, parties, fun, family, entertainment. To others, it's a time of gifts, right? Shopping, spending, giving, and the favorite part, receiving gifts. Um, to many, it's a time to enjoy Christmas music and decorations. Me, I love the music and I love the bright colors. It's easy, though, for Christian families to become distracted with all the stuff that comes with the Christmas season. Instead of dreaming of a white Christmas this year, let's dream of a right Christmas this year. What does it actually mean? Let's take the time to reflect upon the first Christmas, what actually happened and what we can actually learn from the true story of the Christmas story, especially on the thought of sovereign and Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So Luke the physician is giving us his gospel, and he tells us about the day when Christ was born. He tells us about the sovereign, the earthly sovereign at the time. The word sovereign means a, a supreme ruler. So the re supreme ruler over the empire, which included Israel or Palestine, was the Roman Empire, and the, that ruler was Caesar. Caesar Augustus, according to the text. His real name was Octavian. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was his last name. Caesar was taken on as a title and that title, Caesar, was the surname of Julian Caesar. Uh, it afterward became a title for Roman emperors. And, you know, you realize that it has perpetuated that same title in, in, the, in Germany as Kaiser or in Russia as Tsar. So it, was, it became a title for emperor, ruler. And the word Augustus was chosen by Octavian himself, okay, Julius' uh, nephew, and that word comes from the word augeo, which means awe-inspiring. August. We get the month August from it. All the awe-inspiring colors. But it's been said that the, the Roman Senate gave certain titles to him, such as king, dictator, emperor, but he wasn't satisfied. So Octavian, Caesar, he chose the name Augustus to deify himself, to make himself into a god. Augustus, which means honorable, awe-inspiring, was a compliment to his own greatness. And thus, that's where we get the month of August as well. And so, we see here this Caesar Augustus. He was the sovereign of the land, and he, and he did some things. He, he made some actions. He made a decree, an executive order, that all the world should be taxed. The phrase should be taxed, we would think, okay, he's going to levy a certain percentage to tax the people. This word here more, means more of a census. Okay, they had to count the people. They, they counted what profession they were in, how much property they had, how much money they made, because as the ruler of the Roman Empire, he needed money to pay for his armies as well as the luxury lifestyle that he lived in. So he, he was the one who controlled this vast empire, Caesar Augustus. And during that reign, specifically with him, Octavian Caesar Augustus, there was a false peace in the land at the time. Again, he was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. He was a born fighter. He clawed his way into position number one. He defeated Anthony and Cleopatra. And through his, his genius, through the force of his personality, he put Rome on the map. And he was an empire builder. And under his reign, under his rule, 
years of peace would ensue, over a couple of hundred years, but in his reign, almost 40 years. The word Augustus had never been applied to a human ruler before. It was always applied to a god, small g. So he would begin the trend, which was what we would call hero worship or emperor worship. He was trying to deify himself. Luke, okay, Luke would call him Caesar Augustus. The people at the time in which Luke wrote would recognize through different um, signs, words, and, and phrases attributed to Caesar Augustus, they, they found this in certain archaeological findings that Caesar Augustus was considered savior. He was considered as, in one archaeological finding, a title for Caesar Augustus was savior of the world. So historian John Buchanan said this, when Caesar died, Caesar Augustus died, men comforted themselves reflecting that Augustus was a god and that gods do not die. So at this time, Luke's audience, the hearers of this gospel, his audience would have understood that Caesar Augustus was a self-proclaimed God and Savior, a man who wanted to become God, a God. At the time that this, this decree, this census was issued, the Roman Forum, you know, the, 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 the city hall, so to speak, the place of government, governance, the Roman Forum had the Temple Janus. The Temple Janus was the temple of war. It had been closed. The doors of the Temple of Janus, the Temple of War, had been closed for a decade and were to remain closed for some 30 years longer. You know, it would be as if in the United States, the war room. The doors of the war room were closed for 10 years at this point in time. So there was a false peace, a Roman peace. It's called the Pax Romana. Okay? The Roman peace would, would begin, and for 40 years, at least during his existence, it would be the Roman peace. It would be called the peace of the mailed fist. And what does that mean? It was in those days, during the false Roman peace, that the Prince of Peace would come. One commentator, G. Campbell Morgan, said it in this way. Yes, there was a peace, but he said this. That was the most damnable condition the world had ever seen. I'm not glorifying war, but when the reason of no war was that the people were bludgeoned into submission so that no man or woman, boy or girl, dare peep or chirp or mutter or call his soul his own or her own because of the despot on the throne. That was the darkest hour the world had ever seen. Romans regarded peace not as an absence of war, but the rare situation that existed when all of their opponents had been beaten into subjection and they lost their ability to resist. There was a peace, but it was an oppressive peace. It was a fearful peace. It was a dark peace peace, where a man tried to become a god. But it was at this time, this time, the fullness of the time had come, that God sent forth his son. This dark time of peace, God would send the light of the world. During this time of false peace or oppressive peace, God would send the prince of peace. So this is an exciting time. Let's look at verse 3 of Luke 2. In all that went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and to Judea and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So we saw the earthly sovereign mentioned and his titles given. In this text, there is no heavenly sovereign titles given. But we see the invisible hand of the sovereign God moving and working. Now, if you could imagine Joseph and Mary. Mary is now great with child, eight, nine months pregnant. Now she is being forced by a decree from this earthly sovereign, you must go, this is where Joseph was going, he had to go, roughly a three-day journey 
an 80-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem by walking or by donkey. Imagine an eight-month pregnant lady having to go 80 miles. Okay, you, you, you would think, look, Joseph and Mary are just small characters. They're pawns in the chests of life, and men are moving. You know, there's an earthly decree by a, by a sovereign earthly king or emperor, and he's causing them to move, and you think they're just victims, but they're not. It seems that the hand of man was moving them, but every move that they made was under the hand of Almighty God. This Sovereign who is not seen, but whose hand is working, we see his actions. This sovereign God's hand made a decree. He made a decree as well. God made a decree 700 years before this time. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, God's decree was this, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for, thou, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. You know, politically speaking, a decree is when a, a, a king or a president gives an executive order and it comes to pass. Theologically speaking, this decree by God, 700 years before Christ was born, was, was as, as a predetermined purpose of God. God said this was going to happen, and it was going to happen no matter what. This was a, a decree that God had given um, Job 22, 28 says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established. God says it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. He calls the things that are not as though they were, and it comes to pass. And so, even though you think that this earthly sovereign is in control of the lives of Joseph and Mary, the truth is, the heavenly sovereign is overruling the rule of men. So this earthly sovereign is only doing what the heavenly sovereign wants him to do. And we see this purpose over and over again as he says in Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. So the wisdom of God overrules the actions of men for a higher and a nobler purpose. So the emperor's goal was to fill his coffers, to fill his treasury, but the, earth, or the heavenly sovereign's goal or purpose was to fulfill his prophecy, which was prophesied 700 years before. So there are sovereigns who are ruling, but there is one who is Lord over all, the heavenly sovereign. So let's just take a minute to think about God's absolute sovereignty. Okay? God's absolute sovereignty is the aspect of his character by which he exerts absolute rule and control over every aspect of his creation. Everything. Everything that happens in this world happens with God's permission. God always has the power to prevent a thing from happening. And if God allows it to happen, then he has decided beforehand. He is foreordained to allow it to happen. If things were to happen outside of God's control, that would mean God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, God is not God. He's just a big being in the sky who has control over a few things. So let's just think about it for a moment. If there is one molecule, if there is one molecule in the universe running around wild, crazy, outside of God's control, then we have no guarantee that any of God's promises will come true because that one uh, maverick molecule, that one puny particle, that one elusive element can be running around and eventually cause one of his promises not to come to pass. So God is absolutely sovereign. He won't allow anything to wreck his plan. So if this is true, right, no, no Christian believes that anything Anything can thwart God's purpose or his plan or what he allows or what he prevents. So, you know, you take a look at today's newspaper, the headlines. You look at your own life, you know, that unexpected diagnosis. You know, that, that layoff that came out of nowhere. You know, the, the unemployment, the ill health, that scary phone call. the events within our nation and around the world 
you look at all these things and you ask the question, do you see anything going on that is beyond God's control? You can look far and near. You can look east and west, north and south. Whichever way you look, you cannot find anything beyond God's control because he is absolutely sovereign. He is Lord of all. So how does that apply to me and you? If this earthly sovereign is doing this thing, but behind the scenes, this heavenly sovereign is controlling all the events, you know what, how it should be practically translated in our lives? One word. Relax. Relax. God's in control. He is sovereign. There's nothing beyond his control. There's no event, no circumstance in life. Those circumstances may change, but God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can trust him because he is good and he's sovereign. He's in control. So take comfort. Take comfort that God is good and he's in control. Let's continue in verse 8 here. And we'll move real quickly here. And there were in their same country, Luke 2, 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. So the angel pronounces to the, to the shepherds, Look, this is a great happening. This circumstance is incredible. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. He was announced to be three things. The first one is Savior. Even his very name, Jesus, which is the equivalent Old Testament Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah saves. His name gives us a description of why he came. He came to be Savior. He came that we might be saved. And by the way, sometimes you might ask somebody, said, hey, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. And if I were to ask you as a Christian, what are you saved from? What are you saved from? The truth is we are saved from calamity, a disaster. You know, if you would think a farmer, his disaster would be a drought or a blight. You think of a pilot, his disaster would be a bad plane and a crash and burn situation. But every individual has a calamity, a future judgment that is coming. It's appointed the men once to die and after this the judgment. And the Bible says that you are to flee from that judgment. You are to run Flee from the wrath, the judgment that is to come. What is the greatest catastrophe or calamity that every individual will face? That calamity is the God of judgment. The wrath of God on sin. The calamity of God the Father's just anger at sin. So what sets off Christianity from all other religions? Why should you choose Christianity over the faith or religion of all other claims to ultimate truth? There's one imposing reason why you should do so. And that one reason is the answer to two questions in regards to our topic right here. Number one, who initiates my rescue? Okay? Who initiates my rescue? And number two, from whom must I be rescued? The answer to both is one word. God. It's a point in the men once to die, then after this the judgment. But God in his goodness, God in his love, sent the Savior to save us from the wrath of God the judgment which is to come. And therefore God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. 
So he is called Savior in this text. He is called Christ. Christ is the, the Old Testament equivalent of Messiah, which means the chosen one. So here God sends, and by word of the angel, by mouth of the angel, Christ, right? Savior, who is Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, and then the word Lord. He is Lord, Christ the Lord. And the Lord means sovereign. In the Old Testament, Psalm 8, 1, the text goes like this. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And that the, the two Hebrew names, Lord and Lord, are spelled differently. One is Lord, all caps. One is Lord, one cap, capital L in small case, O-R-D. And there are two different Hebrew words for Lord. One is Yahweh or Jehovah, the self-existent, covenant-keeping God of Israel. And then small case, L-O-R-D, Lord with small case O-R-D. That means Adonai in the Hebrew. And the word Adon in the Hebrew means manager. Okay? And Adoni was the manager of a household. But if you, if you added the, the suffix I, Adonai, it means Lord of all. The supreme administrator and ruler of all. And in the New Testament, after Messiah, Messiah is the, the, is the title most used for, or Christ, is the most used for Jesus. But the second title that's used for Jesus most is the word Kyrios, or the Old Testament equivalent, Lord. So the New Testament writers knowingly, consciously applied the title Lord God, Supreme Ruler of All, to Jesus. So who is this baby that would be born in a manger? Who was this one that was announced by the angel? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, who is Lord. You, you, can, you can search from cover to cover in the Bible. There is no other title higher than Christ the Lord. You can pick any other title, and it's, it can't match Christ the Lord. The New Testament explains in the most, uh, the highest terms who this baby is. This baby, as Paul would say, and great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. Who? The Lord came in the flesh as a man. Christ the Lord. In fact, Paul would say it in this way. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did Jesus affirm this over and over again? Jesus, in indirect testimony, he would, he would, without directly saying that he was God, Jesus would lay claim, he would lay distinction and power that could not be affirmed to any other man. He would say that he was preexistent. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am always, I've always existed. Only God can say that. He would say, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Only God can say that. In John 17, 3, he is praying and he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was even created, restore me unto that glory. You know who can say that? Only God could say that. And Jesus said it. And therefore, what's the conclusion? Jesus is God. He is the Lord. His preexistence. He said, all power is given unto me on heaven and earth. And he, and he showed it, right? The deaf are made to hear. The lame are made to walk. The blind are made to see. The sinner is forgiven. He had all power on heaven and in earth. He was also infallible. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. His words were without error and they could not be broken. He would say, he is the embodiment of truth. I am the way the truth, and the life. Who can say that? All the other religions of the world say, point, this is the way to truth, this is the way to truth, point, this way, go this way, follow this path, go this eightfold path, go this threefold path. But Jesus would say, I am the way. Who can say such a bold statement? Only God. 
he claimed to be sinless. To his, his accusers, he would say, which of you convinces me of sin? The answer was no one could. The scriptures say that he knew no sin, he did no sin, and in him was found no sin. He would, he, would ex- he would have exclusive dominion. He would say, follow me, and men would leave everything to follow him. He would forgive sin, which was the, the prerogative only of God, and he did it. He forgave sin and healed the man and demonstrated that he had power on earth to forgive sin. Direct testimony. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Peter would say, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. There's direct testimony from Peter. And then Jesus went on to say right after that, he said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. My Father, he would directly say his connection with the heavenly Father. And just in case we didn't understand, because you'll have people over and over again saying, Jesus wasn't God, he never claimed to be God, never demonstrated himself to be God. But what you need to do is you look at his enemies, and you know what his enemies will do? His enemies, his enemies will clarify the reason why they killed him. In John 10, Jesus says, For what good works do you stone me? And you know what their response is? They say, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, maketh thyself God. So hallelujah. You know what the angels sing? God came to earth. Baby. In a manger. Of humble birth. In order to give us second birth. So I close here. This contrast that the scripture gives us, Caesar Augustus, the secular sovereign, a man who wanted to become a god. But the truth is, during this Christmas season, we glory and bask in the truth of the incarnation that God became a man, and not just a man, but a savior, who is Christ, the chosen one, who is the Lord of all. One of the kings in Europe, he, uh, his, his court worried about him because he would disguise himself and go and live among the people. And, their res- and his response to them was, listen, I cannot rule my people unless I know how they live. And so the scripture says God became a man and he was tempted in all points as we are, yet he was without sin. There was a saying in colonial America in some of the pubs and the taverns and and all around. It said, look, we serve no sovereign here. That same independent attitude has sunk into American Christianity and American lives and American Christians and individual Christians as well. Remember that there is a sovereign. Jesus didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay on the cross when he died for our sins, but he was buried and that he rose again. And he is Lord. And he tells us this, Take up your cross, follow me. And so, three questions as I close. Number one, if you are hurting, if you've gone through something that is just, just got you in a tailspin, and you're, and you're spinning, and you, you don't have your legs under you, let me remind you, Jesus is Lord of all. He's good, he's God. He's sovereign, and you can trust him. Number two, if you are a Christian, you know the claims of Christ and what it means to follow him. I ask you, are you following? Are you following? And the Holy Spirit's putting his finger right on your heart right now. I'm not following right here. Let me, let me encourage you, repent. Receive God's forgiveness. And, and, and lay hold of his grace and start living rightly. And lastly, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what the, the good news was? The angel said, I bring you good tidings of joy for all men. Okay, what does that mean? The good news is that you can be forgiven of your sin. You can flee from the judgment that is to come. It's appointed to men once to die and after this the judgment But if you repent, turn from your sin, and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you know what the Bible says? You've been forgiven. 
You've, brought, you've been brought from death to life, darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God's dear Son. If you repent and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That is the good news. Hallelujah. We have a Savior, and his name is Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your love and your grace. Help us, Lord, as we live for you, as we think of this season, as we rejoice in the truth of the incarnation and the good news that it means to us individually and as a people, as a church. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't know Jesus as Savior or as Lord. Pray for me. Raise your hand nice and high. Lord, Pastor, pray for me. I am not saved. I don't know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this time of year, what it represents, what it stands for, what it means to us personally. Lord, I ask that you would bless every heart with the truths that were sung and with the truth that has been preached and will give you the glory for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please stand. We have one more song, and Brother Steve is going to come and lead us. All right.